Hey y'all, Coach and Fight here, talking about the Memorial of Blowing of Trumpets. That's right, the first day of the seventh biblical month is fastly approaching, and as I promised you guys, I would come in and give a detailed class on what it is that we're supposed to be doing on the Memorial of Blowing of Trumpets. We're also going to talk about the relationship between the Memorial of Blowing of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah as they call it and its relationship to the 10 days of awe. We're going to tell you the significance of the Memorial of Blowing of Trumpets with its relationship to the end gathering of our father's people, the regathering of Israel, understanding that it's talking about spiritual Israel. We're going to talk about the offering made by fire and what it is that we can do to make an offering made by fire on the memorial of blowing of trumpets. And we're also, like always, we're going to give you some biblical fun facts related to this day. So stick around. When you're looking over here in Leviticus 23, you see that the memorial of blowing of trumpets falls on the first day of the seventh month so that is a new moon day the significance of it being a new moon day as you see over in Ezekiel chapter 46 and 1 is on that day the inner courts will be opened talking about that third temple that is to be built on the hearts of humanity just like the first temple and just like the second temple even here in this spiritual temple you can expect the inner court to be opened so you can expect things like spiritual rejuvenation and divine inspirations. Just like a Sabbath day, people will tend to be quiet and listening on that day. Listening to that inner voice as our Father communicates with us spirit to spirit. But notice how Leviticus 23 says it is a one day celebration. But when you look at over here at Google, it says that it is a two day celebration. You should be asking where did this extra day come from? To get an understanding of this extra day, you can look at uh, Wikipedia. See how it says that the Torah or the first five books of the Bible is talking about Leviticus 23 defines Rosh Hashanah as a one day celebration. It is a one day celebration. You say, well, how are they getting two days out of that? Well, look down here. Jewish law. Jewish law. Stressing that word ish means they are acting like Jews. Jewish laws appears to be that Rosh Hashanah is to be celebrated for two days. In other words, they made it up. That second day they made it up. And why? Because of the difficulty of determining the date of the new moon. Of course, they would have done this before we had Internet, before we had the U.S. Naval Observatory posting that the fraction of the moon illuminated, before we had renewed moon. And even people all over the world that are willing to go out there and look for that moon, they decided to have a two day celebration. But that's not biblical. That other day, ignore that day. That's not biblical at all, guys. They made it up. Just because they make that day up and say that it, you know, benefits them to have an extra day, you know, our Father is not going to move the date of his inner court to please man. He never does anything to please man. His rules are his rules. He doesn't change because, you know, things are difficult for us. Obedience to his law is what makes things easy for us and anytime we step outside of his law where things are going to get difficult but anyway before we get into the meat of this conversation let me show you a few fun facts related to the first day of the seventh month for instance how the daily sacrifice what you hear about over there in the book of Daniel was actually given back on the first day of the second month. This is talking about the second temple after they had rebuilt it after the 70 years of captivity. 
they actually start performing the ceremonies on the first day of the seventh month. It was like one of the first things that they did was start the activities in the temple on the first day of the seventh month, the second temple. Well, when you look at the first temple, the one that Solomon built, he started his activities in that temple on the first day of the seventh month. You see that in first Kings and chapter eight. So as we sit here awaiting the dedication or the construction of the third temple, we should find it significant that they dedicated the first temple and the second temple on the first day of the second month. When we look over at the book called Gad the Seer, which is a book that you can see referenced in, I believe, First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 29. It might be Second Chronicles chapter 29 and 29. It is one of the books that was left out of the Canaan by Constantine back there during the Council of Trent or the Council of Nicaea when he decided which books would be included in our Bible. This book, Gad the Seer, talks about Rosh Hashanah and what activities are to take place on the first day of the seventh month. Notice how it calls it New Year's Day. This is the New Year's of the biblical month. You know how man has his celebration of New Year's on the first day of January? Well, that ceremony or that celebration that he is doing came from the New Year's celebration that we are supposed to be doing on the first day of the seventh month. So just for grins and giggles, maybe we can whip out some firecrackers on that day. I don't see anything that says we can't. It is about making noise. You know, we are blowing trumpets. But anyway, you can read about that over in the book of Gad the Seer. But what I wanted to show you in this book is how the book of life is opened on the first day of the seventh month. You see that man dressed in linen? That's that same individual we hear about, I think, over there in Ezekiel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 12. It is he that is opening these three books on the day of Rosh Hashanah. You have the first book, which contained the just deeds of the people. Those are the people that's going to get eternal life. And you see that there is a second book that's opened that contained the unintentional sins of our father's people and then you also see a third book open which contained the wicked deeds of the people and you can read about what happened to these people right here the wicked people are turned over to satan the just people are receiving eternal life well you see that the unintentional sins that book is kept for 10 days. See right there it says a third part of the month. One third of 30 is 10. That's where you get the 10 days of all from. So I bring this up because Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the 10 days of all. The memorial of blowing of trumpets is an extremely important day. We're looking here at a diagram designed by Clarence Larkin you can find this over on Google searching for Clarence Larkin charts coming from his book Dispensational Truth he has a whole section in that book on the feast days and what he states about the memorial blowing of trumpets is Israel is to be gathered back to their own land on the memorial blowing of trumpets and he lists several verses here it says we are told in Matthew chapter 24 that they are to be summoned by angelic trumpeters and he's pointed to the feast of trumpets well here is another fun fact when it comes to the feast days in general you see over in Zechariah and chapter 14 verses 12 through 18 how it is talking about the plagues 
Now, this is important now as we're dealing with pandemics and such. But you can see over in the book of Zechariah and even in the book of Jubilees that we are told that those who actually participate in these holy convocation will not be harmed by these plagues. It is verse 18 that says that those who don't participate in tabernacles are the ones that will receive these plagues. We'll talk more about that one as we get closer to the Feast of Tabernacles. It is one of the mandatory feasts. We see that the memorial of blowing of trumpets is not included in the mandatory feasts. As you see over there, Exodus chapter 23, verses 14 through 17, that talk about the three mandatory feast days, which is unleavened bread, the Feast of Pentecost, and the week-long feast of tabernacles I believe I personally believe that the reason why trumpets is not included in that is because it's primarily for the priests not everybody is expected to blow that trumpet it was the priests responsibility to go out and see that moon and start to blow the trumpets and let everybody know that we were in the new month they did that every month but since now we are in a new year, I think it adds more significance to that trumpet blast that they will sound to let everybody know. But when you're looking over in Leviticus 23, it doesn't necessarily say to blow the trumpets. It is saying that it is a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets. It is a holy convocation and everybody can take part in that part, I believe. So let's look here in Leviticus 23 and see what else we're expecting to do on this day. You see right there where you see Leviticus 23 and 23 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses. You see this up there at the beginning of Leviticus 23 where it calls these the feast of the Lord. These are not the feast of Moses. You know, people who like avoiding the law, that wicked that are talked about over there in the book of Gad, the people that don't want to keep the law will say that these are the feast of Moses and Jesus did away with them. That's lunacy. Our father never changes. He instituted these feasts and he expected them to go on forever. It even says in Leviticus 23 throughout your generations for forever. We're supposed to keep these feasts. These are the feast of the Lord. We see in verse 24, it says, speak unto the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. So it's talking to the children of Israel and it's talking to us, guys. Again, the people who want to be disobedient will try to say that he was talking to the Jews way long time ago and that he wasn't speaking to us now. But when you look over in Deuteronomy and chapter 5 and verse 3, you see a different story. This is Moses preparing for his spiritual journey, if you know what I mean. He is reminding the people of the covenant that was made back there in Mount Horeb. That's what you find in the book of Exodus chapter 20 through 23. It actually ends in verse 7 of chapter 24. That is the book of the covenant given to Moses at Mount Horeb, that is the law, guys. I keep bringing this up. There's a lot of people that's trying to steer you away from righteousness. Like the book of Romans chapter 10 says people have created their own righteousness, not based on knowledge. They're just making stuff up. They try to steer you away from this covenant. This is the covenant that we're under now. This is the covenant that we're going to be under in the future. The only difference between the covenant that was given at Mount Horb and the covenant that's going to be given to us when we enter the new covenant is that those same laws that you read about in Exodus chapter 20 through 23 will be written on our heart. Then they were written on tablets. In the future, they're going to be written on our heart, but it's going to be the same covenant the same rules nothing is going to change about those rules even until the end of the earth but anyway you look right there at verse 3 it says the Lord made not this covenant with our fathers 
but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive today is talking about us. It's talking about you listening to this video. It's talking about us right now. This covenant is with us, guys. Don't let people fool you. Remember, there are three books that are opened. According to the book of Gad, the seer. The book of the just. Those are people who have been keeping these rules, this covenant for a long time now. Then there is the book of unintentional sins. That's for the majority of us who are just now finding out about these rules. We didn't know we was in error by not keeping these feast days. It was unintentional that we was breaking these feast days. We would have been celebrating with the Lord for a long time if, we, if somebody had told us about it. So that was unintentional. And then you have the wicked. The people who done read this stuff and are not only not obedient to it, but even going on to try to convince others that they shouldn't be doing it either. Don't be fooled by those guys. They're trying to get you in that sinking ship with them. They're trying to get you to go down with them. They don't want to be alone. They're trying to get everybody they can to go down with them. I say sayonara. It's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. Jumping back over here, Leviticus chapter 23. It says, speaking to the children of Israel, it's talking about spiritual Israel. Which is defined over in the third testament of the Bible, which you can find a link to in the description of this video. Chapter 39, which also explains who the 144,000 are and what their mission is in life, also explains spiritual Israel and who they are. You see down there in verse 14, it says spiritual Israel is scattered all over the globe and wherever any one of them is found, he or she receives my charity, fills my presence is sustained by my bread and awaits me without knowing where I might come nor in what form yet they wait. That's who spiritual Israel is. His charity fills his presence is sustained by his bread. Now the bread is talking about the word of God. You know, these are people who are reading his word. And I'll wait in his presence. It goes on to give more detail who these guys are. You can read that again in chapter 39 of the Third Testament of the Bible, which you can find a link to in the description of this video. But coming back over here to Leviticus in chapter 23, that we see in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, and we've already talked about that. That is a new moon day. It says it shall be a Sabbath day. A memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. So this is a day when you'll get your family members together and y'all celebrate. Man has a bunch of unholy convocations all year long. Labor Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas. The Father has holy convocations that we're supposed to have on his seven feast days listed over in Leviticus 23. So memorial, meaning that it's a memory, it's a memory of the end gathering that is supposed to take place. So that's what we're doing. We're remembering that event, even though it hasn't prophetically occurred yet. It is a holy convocation, meaning it's a big deal. Verse 25 says, ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So when we come over and we look at a, one of the definitions for servile, it says having or showing an excessive willingness to serve or please others or the characteristic of a slave or slaves. It is the day that we stop being slaves to the man, if you know what I mean. You look over in the Merriam Webster, it says or befitting a menial position. Or cravingly submissive. In other words, that ain't the day you go down to your job. You know, one brother was talking about how he was a security officer and he wasn't doing any hard labor. Well, I don't know if he's able to do that kind of work on this day. Even though he's sitting there watching cars go by, he's still serving his boss. He's being still being submissive. And you remember that the the new moon day is a day that the inner courts is open. 
This is a day you want to be submissive to our father. And so being down there with Mr. Charlie ain't going to get it on this day. This is a day you want to take off work. If you work for the government, you're supposed to get this day off as a religious observance. Some of you would have to put in leave for this day. Some of you are call in sick on this day. Then notice it goes on and says, but you said offer an offering made by fire. Now, when you come over to the book of Numbers in chapter 29, you'll see what is going on behind the scenes when it comes to this offering made by fire. Remember that we have a high priest now who is standing in for the duties that used to be performed by Aaron. And even up until the time when they had a brick and mortar temple. And we will do these feast days in the future. You see over there in the book of Malachi in chapter 3 verses 3 through 4 that these offerings are going to be reinstituted starting with the sons of Levi. And I've been trying to tell you guys, I've done a few classes touching on this subject and I'll probably do more. The Levites are the firstborn males in your family. The people around you were supposed to be your priests, your Levites. The only difference between a Levi and a priest is the priest is anointed. A Levi is any firstborn male of your family, particularly between the age of 25 and 50. He is supposed to be in the service of the Lord. So he is the one that our father is going to move to start making these offerings to. So if you see those guys start, you know, acting a little bit strange. It's because that is what is promised over here in Malachi is that he's going to move in those guys first. These could be your sons. These could be your daddy, your uncle, your cousin. Anybody who is the firstborn male of their mother is a Levi. They are the ones that are supposed to be making these offerings that we see over there in the book of Numbers and in, and in other places. I bring that up, guys, because you can start working with these guys already. You can start praying for them. You can even get you some oil and go through a symbolic anointing. You're going to need these guys to actually take on their responsibilities and their role as the priests, as the laborers. These is who our father put down here to carry the word for him. Not them preachers down there at the church. Not them ones down there. Not them priests down there at the uh, Catholic church. At the mosque or at the mass or whatever you call it. You know. The same ones who wanted to get away from the feast days, they wanted to get away from the Levitical priests too. And so they made those firstborn males get a job with the rest of us. And then they stood in and started carrying or trying to carry the word. This is why you hear people say you shouldn't be listening to Gentiles. You, know, you shouldn't be listening to people who aren't of this group here teach you about the scripture they're going to lead you astray guys but anyway understand who it is think about it for a second who are the firstborn males in your family start praying for them start putting this book in their hand their day is coming when the father is going to move in on their heart and start bringing them to the idea of keeping these burnt offerings but anyway I bring you over here to Numbers in 29 so that you can see how much of an offering is being made, even behind the scenes. Bulls, lambs, and all of that kind of thing is being done over here on the first day. It's being done spiritually. But one day it's going to be physical again. But let me show you over here in Leviticus 2. Not all of the offerings are flesh offerings there is a grain offering and this is where many of us start off guys my first offering was a grain offering flour you know you heard that saying that if you take one step towards our father he would take two steps towards you you know so it was one day when I was understanding this and I grabbed me a handful of fly flour and I put it on a fire call myself making a grain offering as you read over there in Leviticus in chapter 2 they are bread offerings too my second offering I made some cakes made with flour and oil 
and I burnt those on the fire. We are supposed to have an altar, guys. You see over as part of the covenant. Chapter 20, verse 24 says, An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me. Meaning we are supposed to have this altar. And it's not that big a deal, guys. Don't be thinking about nothing huge and elaborate. Even the altar I have now is pretty much a dirt hole with some rocks around it just to identify where it actually is. I have an altar of earth. So we are supposed to have these things anyway. But this is for those who want to fulfill this requirement. I know not everybody is, but there's some of you out there that want to keep this to the letter and you're going to be trying to do this offering made by fire. And I've always said, this is where the Bible study starts, guys. The question ain't whether we should be doing a memorial blowing of trumpets. The question is, is how do we do it right? That's where we should be studying. You know, all that nonsense about we shouldn't be doing it. You know, that's the wicked. You look back over there at Gad and see what happens to them people. They end up in a bad place. You see right there where it says, and Satan took the wicked to the wasteland and destroyed them there. Those are the people who don't want to keep these feast days. We are in the days of awe right now. And the Father is looking at us to see if we are going to do this correctly. I'm working on another class now. I didn't plan on going into it too intently. But I believe these 10 days of awe started in 2017 with the Revelations 12 sign in the sky. I believe that was the Rosh Hashanah blowing of them trumpets in 2017. And I believe we're in 10 days of awe now where us who have been committing these unintentional sins are being given the opportunity to get right. We didn't know about these feast days and we're given 10 years to get them right. If we ain't got them right, come the year 2027, I believe we're going to be down there with them wicked guys on atonement day. Going off into the uh, wilderness for Satan to do with them or, you know, what they want to do. But anyway, like I said, I'll save that for another class. So anyway, that pretty much everything that we're supposed to be doing on this day. The memorial blowing of trumpets is not that big of a deal. Taking off work and having a holy convocation, a type of Sabbath day. And maybe even blowing a horn. And when it comes to these horns, guys, most of you ain't got no shofar. You know, a ram's horn. You know, but notice it says trumpet. At one point, they were instructed to make trumpets made of silver. Ain't none of you got them either. But that shouldn't stop you from blowing a horn. You do have other horns around your house. You got the horn on your car. Some of you got old instruments from high school bands. You got whistles. Remember the purpose of this was to let everybody know what season this is. And so it's not only actually making noise, you know, but it's also making people aware of what's going on, too. So you might let your family members know about it. Find them Levi's in your family. Give them a heads up, you know, pull them to the side and say, you're special guy. You know, and that's part of the reason why the priests and the pastors and the preachers, they don't want to hear about um, these Levites, these firstborn males. You hear about these guys over in Numbers chapter 3 and verse 12. The Levites are the firstborn males. You see that in Numbers chapter 3 and verse 41. Levites are the firstborn males. Chapter 3 and verse 45. I'm going to probably do a whole class on this subject one day. Look like it's all coming from chapter 3. Look like there's something in verse 8. And I have taken the Levites for all the firstborn of the children of Israel. Those Levites in old that you hear about sons of Aaron. They were a living parable. An example of what was to come. Shadows and all of that kind of stuff they be talking about. He was talking about us. The firstborn males now have the same responsibilities. Anytime you see Levites or sons of Aaron. He's talking about the firstborn males. So you guys you know, can be giving them a heads up. Let them know that you guys are special. And like I was saying, you know, you know, the pastor, Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug, he don't want to hear nothing about the Levi because he's not one. He don't want nobody to be more special than he is. And when you start telling him um, you're actually standing in the role 
of the firstborn male. You're actually standing in the role of the priest. You need to move out of the way and let those guys have their rightful position so they can start teaching us correctly. He don't want to hear that. He say ain't nobody ain't nobody special or whatever because he wants to be special and he don't want to recognize these guys. They are special. You see right there, in, uh, three and forty-five is not only the firstborn males of humans, but it's the firstborn males of cattle, sheep, everything, horses, donkeys. P we grow sheep here on our property, and the only thing we could do with a firstborn male lamb is to eat him. That's, that's the significance of that. We can't sell him. We can't ride him. We can't use him for pre breed stock. We can't do anything other. Then to cut his throat and put some fire on them. So don't be jealous. Alright guys, well that's all I can think of as far as what we're supposed to be doing on this day. I think I've covered it everything. And even more than I actually intended to cover. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. If you got something out of this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button. But leave us a comment either way. Hit that subscribe button and or that bell notification button as we will be putting out classes like this related to Atonement Day and the Feast of Tabernacles, Lord willing. And may our Father bless you and keep you. May our Father make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Father lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.